Besh and Noam. Congratulations on your new documentary, A Thousand Pines. Thank you so much. Thanks. Moreover, congratulations. It, are, it already premiered uh, this week uh, for PBS's Independent Lens. How do you guys feel about that? Uh, extremely excited. You know, you spend years um, making a film and you wonder uh, who's going to see it. And uh, when we found out that we'd been selected by Independent Lens, it it, it was really rewarding because it meant um, some people are going to see it and, and a lot of people are going to see it. And it just felt really rewarding to know that hard work paid off. <laughs> how, how did it feel for you, Sebastian? Yeah, similar, you know, uh, as independent filmmakers, uh, it's really important to try to find distribution. That is really kind of one of the hardest things to achieve uh, so that it can be seen uh, as broadly as possible. And oftentimes you only get to show it at festivals if you're lucky, right? So the fact that besides having a successful festival run, uh, to some extent, uh, we can't complain. Uh, we also, like, this is beyond our dreams, frankly, to, to just know that uh, thousands of eyes uh, can, can watch this film. And also, I, I would add from, like, different, uh, hopefully, that is our hope, from different sort of uh, walks of life, from different kind of points of view, uh, especially, like, when we're talking about the immigration um discussion uh in this country because uh you know the film doesn't have an agenda doesn't have a uh, a point of view particularly about like this discussion it just kind of shows different sides uh of the immigration discussion it shows kind of like the lives of the, the immigrants and their everyday life their struggles what they're going through the day-to-day -to -day. It shows how the job changed uh, originally from the uh, American workers that started to do this kind of job. And so then hopefully audiences can kind of like draw their own conclusions, see how they feel. And if we can touch someone's heart, uh, then we probably did our job. <laughs> Most excellent. So what actually sparked the both of you to uh, do this documentary in the first place? Um, so it, it started in an unlikely way, which was working on a, a PhD dissertation. Um, I have a doctorate in anthropology, and I was studying immigration to the United States, and I had lived in Arkansas and wanted to do research in Arkansas because I love the state and wanted to spend time there. And I spent a summer there um, looking at, you know, with the Latino community and thinking about immigration to Arkansas. But I also was friends with a lot of these old hippies um, who I'd met when I was a high school teacher in Arkansas. And a lot of them were like, oh, if you want to study immigration, you should study tree planting. We used to do it, and now it's all Latino workers. And that wasn't my intention at all at the beginning of the summer when I was trying to pick a project. But by the end of the summer, I thought, oh, that's a fascinating story for a bunch of reasons. One is nobody knows about tree planting. The U.S. is the world's largest producer and consumer of wood products. Over 1.5 billion trees are planted a year in the country for industry, but nobody really knows about it. Um, and so I thought that's interesting. And also the fact that you know, that some of the owners of this company, including the one profiled in the movie, planted themselves, I thought was this really interesting backstory that isn't often the case. You know, many of the people who, let's say, own chicken processing plants in Arkansas did not actually work in the chicken processing plant. Um, mm. But this was different. So I thought it was really interesting. So so for my, uh, so I, I made a movie about it for my dissertation. It was the first movie taken as a dissertation um, ever at the University of Pennsylvania. And I it was a three hour film, the Lawrence of Arabia of dissertations, as I like to say, looking at Mexican planters, American planters and Canadian planters. But it was like a very academic film. I had footnotes on screen and I was the narrator and I was using academic language. Um, and when I finished, I thought, well, there's the, the ingredients here for a movie for a wider audience. And um, I thought I wanted to try to make that, but I also knew I could only make it working with other people. And I had met Sebastian. Uh, we were both living in New York City at the time, and we were members of a group called the Brooklyn uh, Documentary Club, which was a, a, you know just sort of indie filmmakers who met once a month. Um, and I invited him over to my apartment to watch what I had made, um, and and he liked it and, and and was willing to come on. Sebastian, you'd like to add? 
I just saw on the material that Noam uh, captured uh, an, an amazing uh, intimacy uh, with these workers um, during their, their planting season. And then also back in their homes in Mexico with their families. Uh, so it's a testament to Noam's uh, trust that he gained with these men by just being extremely open with them uh, about what he was doing and just kind of embedding himself with them uh, during the planting seasons that he was following them, uh, sleeping on the same beds that they were and uh, sharing meals, uh, riding on the same vans, you know, being on the field with them, uh, delivering waters. He was like the water boy. And so it was, uh, yeah, that uh, allowed him to capture this intimacy that it, it was immediately reflected on, on what I saw when he showed it to me. So uh, as a Mexican immigrant myself, I obviously uh, could relate to a lot of what they were doing. Obviously, I, I uh, well, not obviously, but I'm, I'm, I'm here on, uh, on a different, more privileged uh, uh, situation. I came by, you know, different circumstances and, and I can uh, focus on filmmaking. But uh, anyway, um, I, I definitely can relate to some of the struggles and, and you know, it, it touched definitely a, a vein and I, I wanted to join immediately. So no, so no, I'm all all this footage that you actually uh, captured. This was all originally from your uh, your your dissertation um, um, project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, we did a pickup shoot in twenty twenty two. I think it was you know towards the very end when we had the the contents of the film and the structure and everything. But almost all of it, I was like a one the proverbial one man band um, to sort of going out into the field. And, and to be fair, I don't think it would have been possible to do it with a larger crew. Cause I had to like go around with the people. And I think, you know, like Sebastian said, I think the only reason um, people sort of opened up to me is cause I was sort of committing to it and just sort of living the same lifestyle they were. And I think if there had been a larger crew that would have been really disruptive, but if it was just me alone with the camera, you can, you know, eventually people kind of somewhat forget you're there and, and you can really, um, you know, be a bit more in the background in a way that with a larger crew that just would never have been possible. So did you did you contact a Superior for um, about about your project or did you basically meet the group somehow met met the group that you were filming? So I spoke to Superior and I was like, this is what I want to do. And I think they were. I mean, I think they thought it was an odd <laughs> request, um, but they were like, sure. And so then I went to Mexico to brush up on my Spanish and and then went to Oaxaca where they were. And then they told me like the day before some, I forgot who told me, it was like, uh, get in touch with Raimundo and, and you'll go along with his group. And so I met him the day before. And then like the, the day that they leave, I just was this random uh, fish out of the water there with a camera filming. And it was definitely extremely intimidating i only found out later somebody was spread a rumor that i was an agent for the u.s government um which i'm happy i didn't know at the time and i would have been even more intimidated um but yeah i mean i i i i mean i got permission from superior to film but then sort of just like you know had no guidance and it was just sort of like out of sight out of mind i think from their end as i'm just going around with the screw and i was just traveling and filming so Sebastian, when 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 you aborted this project, it was it was a three hour film. So um, tell tell us about uh, your role specifically. Um, you basically came in to uh, to help it to be more of a documentary that we we now see, which is a uh, le less than an hour. Correct. Uh, Noam's uh, idea was that here we could tell with the same footage. Well, especially given that he shot hundreds of hours, well, over a hundred hours of footage that he had enough there, combined interviews with Verite to make it into like a compelling story that one could follow with a more traditional sort of narrative and potentially like some characters. Uh, there was also the idea that maybe it could be a sort of more observational anthropological kind of film, which I actually like as well. Uh, but uh, early on, we we watched the footage, we had discussions, and we decided that we were going to try and go for what we went for, which it was to try to uh, create uh, uh, some kind of narrative 
and, and follow so, some characters. So yeah, what what I did as a, a as a partner here in the collaboration was help identify who could potentially be uh, the point of view that we tell the story from. We quickly realized that in Raimondo was the perfect person to do this because he's a foreman that has been there for 20 years doing this job. Uh, he knows it back and forth. Uh, and he was very open, very charismatic. And uh, uh, Noam had conducted uh, several interviews with him that we could pull from and use that as a sort of a voiceover narration uh, every once in a while, while staying kind of like on the verite. Um, I also uh, realized uh, along with Noam and our editor, Angela Reginato, that we could, uh, well, that we should actually uh, keep the backstory of the hippies, let's call them, <laughs> uh, former planters turned uh, business owners, because uh, it really created a, a, a context to better understand the, how the circumstances of the job have changed through time for worse, and how like now the Latin workforce are the basically only ones that are willing to do this kind of job under the circumstances that now exist. Uh, so it was really important to kind of like show that evolution and that contrast um, and, and how that lifestyle was so much like different and enjoyable for the hippies where they could like travel with their families and then like kind of like just take three months, three months off a year. Uh, and whereas here is more of a job to endure and a big sacrifice to be away for your from your families for so for so long for these Mexican workers. Absolutely. And Noam, um, did you you didn't follow them um, exec, um, consecutively for seven seven eight months, um, did you? And how how did you manage to convince them to uh, to basically eventually trust you, especially like going to like Oaxaca and um, sure. following them uh, around? So I I was with them for four months straight, and then went back and forth a bunch of times. So I wasn't with them for like the whole eight month um, thing all in a row. Um, and I think, you know, I think a couple things helped uh, in order to like make people friendlier, you know, and and be willing to open up. Um, you know, uh, I, I have a, a sense of humor and can be self-deprecating. And, and so I think like, you know, letting people take the piss out of you and, and be willing to like be the butt of jokes and be OK with that really is is helpful. Like Sebastian said, um, I planted for a few, well, I, I was the water boy. I planted for a few, the original plan, because this was part of like, when anthropology, there's participant observations. So you often like do what you're studying. So originally the plan was to both plant and film. I planted a few weeks and then I just wasn't getting any filming dunks. It's so hard. So I stopped planting and then I was super self-conscious because I, you know, I, I felt very aware of the power differential of like they're busting their hump every day and I'm with a camera. Um, and so then I became the water boy and I'd like bring them water every day a bunch of times when they're out in the field. Um, and, I, you know, I think the last thing is, I think most people have an urge to uh, have a desire to talk about their lives if somebody asks about them, right? I think, um, you know, people want to know that somebody thinks what they're doing is interesting and cares. And I think on some level, they, you know, thought it, there was something interesting about this person who thought it was so interesting, he's going to spend months and years studying it and making a film about it. Um, and I think they, you know, somewhat appreciated that. And, the, you know, the last thing I'll say was what, most of the filming was done in 2013, which was before smartphones were as prolific as they are now. So for a lot of people, they didn't have any footage of them planting. And so one thing that was actually very moving was when I went back to Oaxaca and I visited almost every single person with their family was um, they would have me show them their families and their relatives, the raw footage. And so it was actually very sweet and moving that you had these families and kids and spouses who knew that their partners went away for the majority of the year to do this work, but had never actually seen it and knew what they did. Um, and it was very sweet to be able to share that with them at people's kitchen tables. That is, that is true. That is true. It, it, it is a very good, uh, perspective. So um, let me uh, start wrapping things up uh, with, with you gentlemen. I'm taking a lot of your time already. Is uh, as 
audiences have a chance to watch this, especially on PBS as an independent lens, what is the one most important thing that you hope they walk away with after viewing this film? Well, I would say that um, wherever like you stand on the immigration uh, debate, uh, you know whether you you have uh, more conservative perspectives about it uh, or not, um, the the film really just shows that these are workers that are coming here to do a huge sacrifice for their families and that they really like just want to be with them home and they're here for a better opportunity for their families um and they ha live at least try to live very dignified lives and um and you know that's really like it's uh, noam has uh, said it often which i think it's really true and beautiful that this ultimately is a film about love uh, because it, it really just shows how uh, close and loving they, they they are with their families and vice versa. So that's really that's really it, you know, uh, and, you know, we, we need them. They're essential workers in this country. So somebody has to do it. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have all the paper and wood uh, goods that we use every single day. Uh, and for the houses that we build, that we live in, et cetera. So uh, somebody has to do it and, and they're willing to do it. So, you know, again, like it's not intended to be a political film, but ultimately it uh, ends up uh, being very much so because of all this uh, context and things, just this is reality. You know, I'd say one more thing to add on that is in some ways we intentionally made the film the way we did to try to reach hearts and minds. Like I think the film comes off and is meant to be a sort of relatively objective, not polemical. We do not tell you what to think. Um, I am happy there are films that have very strong point of views that do that. I think those are important. I also think in some ways to reach people who are maybe more in the middle, who are somewhat on the fence, I think an approach like that can be off-putting. And so my hope is that there's like somebody who tuned into PBS um, who watched it and didn't know what they were getting into. And maybe they saw, you know, a trailer and saw the part about the hippie bit and, and thought, oh, you know, this is interesting. Um, and, and watched the film and came away with a more humanized view of immigrants than they started with. Well said. And and one thing before before I leave here, um, the, the song that was uh, featured at the beginning um, and so on, that, that didn't sound like a Spanish song to me. Um, tell, tell, tell us about the song. It's got such a good story. So it's by it's by the Mexican musical superstar Lila Downs. She's from that town where the guys are from. I like I discovered this when I was there and I went to I was staying in a hostel and the woman there was like, oh, have you ever heard of Lila Downs? She's from this town and and her family owns a hardware shop. And, and I went down there and it took years to get in touch with her. So it's it you know, it's an indigenous song written in mixed tech, which we almost put subtitles on for it because it's about like the the mountains and the trees there and 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 so when i first heard it i was like oh my god this is haunting and gorgeous and then i looked at the lyrics and it it, it was like you know it, it felt like fate was was telling us to do it because it's just so on point with the message of the movie but at the same time we we chose not to put the lyrics because it was more about the feeling of the song and didn't we didn't want to necessarily distract and it's not so important what is being said and it was just like such a uh kind of like immersive moment very kind of poetic poetic moment and also it's the same song that we close the film with yeah well said well said well gentlemen sebastian noam thank you very much uh, for carrying this conversation with um a thousand pines everyone could check it out now on pbs's independent lens thank you very much thank you so much thank you.